territory of Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, Takaranto, the traditional Mohawk name of this area called Toronto, meaning a gathering place, and the surrounding areas are still home to Indigenous people, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to meet, work, and play on this territory as settlers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yamna. And now I'd like to pass it on to the board uh, chair for the Council of Agencies Serving South Asians, Sangha Achaksai, who will deliver the welcome remarks. Go ahead, Sangha. Thank you, Samia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth annual South Asian Heritage Month celebration. Today, we have gathered to honor our South Asian trailblazers, our COVID-19 heroes who have not hesitated to go above and beyond their call of duty, to work and advocate for the most vulnerable, marginalized and racialized communities. And I hope um, we can all agree on this platform that since the start of COVID-19, certain groups specifically under the BIPOC umbrella have been the most disadvantaged and the primary targets of COVID-19. COVID-19, which was first introduced as the great equalizer, one that was not supposed to discriminate between the rich and the poor, the privileged and the non-privileged, um, but in fact, delivered the very opposite. It didn't take us long to discover the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on the marginalized and racialized communities who stood and still are at the forefront of the pandemic. By being essential workers, by being commuters of the local transits, by living in small spaces and, and inadequate housing situations where social distancing um, is never an option, by accepting to work under employment conditions that do not allow sufficient sick days for COVID patients to care for themselves. And it is at times as such that we do need our COVID heroes to dedicate special efforts, programs, and services where they are needed the most. We realize that our South Asian Heritage Month poster hasn't really done justice to all the South Asian um, heroes and champions and trailblazers out there who continue their efforts towards um, serving the un underprivileged, but we are honored to showcase the prominent profiles of our six trailblazers whom we have gathered to speak to you today. Feroz Kareem Sukhmeet Singh Sachal, Dr. Supriya Sharma, Dali Begum, who will be joining us soon, Dr. Nahid Dosani and Dr. Samir Sinha. I welcome you all to celebrate our South Asian Heritage Month with us. But right before I pass this virtual torch to Samya, a very special shout out to our very own, our very internal COVID hero, our executive director, Samia Hassan. Since the beginning of COVID era, Samia has put programs and services in place to meet the necessities of our South Asian um, communities. She has prioritized, strategized, and pivoted um, funds to create resources that have met the emerging demands and needs of our marginalized communities, whether it was fighting racism, hate, um, and oppression that was targeted towards specific groups and communities, or dismantling myths and misconceptions around vaccinations, and whether it was the hotline to assist our seniors with their groceries and, and other affairs, or um, the COVID-19 helpline for South Asians in the GTA. She has championed all projects very well. Um, I, on behalf of the board, would like to also extend our gratitude to Samia, who didn't make it to the, to the poster because the poster belongs to her, um, but her um, efforts should really not, not go unmentioned. Um, and with this, I would like to welcome you all once again for joining this very needed, important, and crucial discussion that is about to take place on this very platform. Thank you for joining us. And um, Samia, I'll pass it to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sangha, and I'm really humbled by your kind words. And I think I've got a long way to go before I land on one of these posters. 
um, and really humbled to be in the same space as um, all of these great individuals that we have today. So um, appreciate everything you said, but I think it's um, it's a team effort. We've got a, a, an amazing team here at CASA um, of really great individuals that are working despite the pandemic to support our community. So uh, a round of applause for all of our staff. Um, so for the rest of the evening, I'm going to pass uh, the virtual mic to our, um, Sak our communications coordinator, Sakshi Mehta. Uh, Sakshi is the one who you've probably heard from throughout the planning process of this event. Um, so she will be moderating the discussion today. So Sakshi, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Samia. Hi, everyone. And first of all, happy South Asian Heritage Month. My name is Sakshi, and I'm CASA's communications coordinator who will be monitoring today's event. So just before we begin our panel, I'd actually like to turn it over to some special guests who are here today to briefly just convey their greetings for the event. So first, um, I'll turn it over to Member of Provincial Parliament, Raymond Cho, who would just like to briefly convey his greetings for today's event. Hello, everyone. I'm Raymond Cho, MPP for Scarborough North, and Ontario Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you for inviting me to share in this very special occasion as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the month of May being celebrated South Asian Heritage Month. Our cultural diversity is a source of great strength for our province and for our country. Throughout my three decades in public office, I've been lucky to work with countless South Asian organizations and individuals alike. I'm always encouraged by the strength and the tenacity they embody. No matter what challenges arise, they come together and work collaboratively and find a path forward. Thank you again for adding so much to our community. This has been a challenging time for us all. COVID-19 is a terrible enemy. We have depended on our healthcare workers alike ever before, unlike ever before. Our amazing nurses, doctors, PSWs and support have comforted our most vulnerable. Ontario's heroes in white must never be taken for granted. They truly embody the team Ontario spirit and we owe them our special thanks. In closing, I want to wish you all a very happy South Asian Heritage Month. And on behalf of the government of Ontario, I want to say thank you to all of our COVID-19 heroes. Thank you. Thanks so much, MVP Cho, for taking the time to come here and convey your greetings. Um, now I'd actually like to take a moment to act, introduce the theme of this year's event as um, Samia has already mentioned as well, it's COVID-19 Heroes. Um, we do have one more special guest, um, MP Sean Chen also wanted to convey his greetings, but he was unable to make it here today. So he sent in a special little video message for the attendees and our COVID-19 leaders just to give us his regards. And Member of Parliament for Scarborough North, wishing everyone at CASA a very happy South Asian Heritage Month. Indeed, the month of May is an opportunity for all of us to recognize the incredible contributions of Canadians of South Asian descent to building our great country, especially right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, when Canadians have had to come together. I would like to recognize our South Asian community members who are working 
at the front lines, providing essential services, health care to Canadians in need. Your service and your work is so important, and I thank you for everything that you are doing. I would also like to acknowledge CASA and their incredible work over many years to unite many organizations, stakeholders, and members of the South Asian community. Collectively, your voice is strong and can be heard all throughout this great country. Let us continue to celebrate your incredible histories and lived experiences. Let us continue to ensure that your role in building this great country is recognized and acknowledged. I wish you all a very happy South Asian Heritage Month. Awesome. Okay, so thank you again, um, MPP Cho and MP Sean Chen, who wasn't able to be here but sent us a message for conveying your greetings. Um, so I just want to move on to talk a little bit more about our panel event this year. So evidently, we know this year looked a little different for us all, and it's been a year of change and growth. So for South Asian Heritage Month this year, we are commemorating some leaders here today who have been actively making a difference in their communities. And so I'd like to now go into introducing our six COVID-19 leaders. So I'm just going to share our official poster All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, perfect. All right, so this is CASA's 2021 official South Asian Heritage Month poster. So I'd like to introduce our six COVID-19 heroes. First, I introduce to you um, Dolly Begum. So elected in 2018, Dolly Begum is the MPP for Scarborough Southwest and the first Canadian of Bangladeshi origin to hold elected office in Canada. At Queen's Park, Dolly is the official opposition critic for citizenship, foreign credential, and immigration services and has been tirelessly advocating for equity in Scarborough as a hotspot for COVID-19. Our next leader I'd like to introduce is Farouz Kareem, and um, for our leaders, if you could like give a wave and um, just to introduce yourself while I read out a little more about you. So Farouz is an advocate and a student who has been amplifying the voices of youth and those that have been historically excluded in the mainstream discourse. Throughout the pandemic, she has worked on creating Project Youth Voices, a platform to help youth just like herself cope through the stresses of the pandemic through creative expression. Farouz has been involved in designing Ham on Washroom, a social media advocacy campaign creating dialogue about the inequities in public washroom access. Next, we have another youth leader, Sukmeet Singh Sachal. So Sukmeet is a medical student at UBC who founded the Sick Health Foundation with the vision of providing culturally effective public health interventions to South Asians at Gurdwaras in Surrey, BC. With over 150 youth volunteers, his team helped develop masks that can tie around turbans and help educate over 10,000 individuals about COVID-19 in Punjabi and Hindi. Since then, the project has expanded across Canada and internationally. Next, we have Dr. Nahid Dosani. As a palliative care physician and health justice activist, Dr. Nahid Dosani is dedicated to advancing equitable access to healthcare for people experiencing homelessness and marginalization. These efforts include founding palliative education and care for the homeless, so PEACH, and serving as medical director for a regional COVID-19 isolation or housing program in the Toronto area. Dr. Dosani shares his passion for health equity through education and advocacy efforts that include media, public speaking, and through social media. Next, we have Dr. Samir Sinha. Dr. Sinha is the Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health and UHN, and he quickly became a go-to expert during the COVID-19 pandemic, advocating for needs of older persons and those living in long-term care homes. As a Director of Health Policy Research at the National Institute on Aging at Ryerson, he has led research on aging and how to better support older Canadians throughout the pandemic. As a person who advises hospitals and health authorities in Canada on innovative models of geriatric care, he is now supporting the development of the new national long-term care standards for Canada. And lastly, we have Dr. Supriya Sharma. 
As the Chief Medical Advisor, Dr. Supriya Sharma provides medical and scientific advice on many aspects of Health Canada's COVID-19 response and is the department's representative on the Special Advisory Committee with the Public Health Agency of Canada and Chief Medical Officers from across the country. She's one of the key spokespersons in the government's efforts to inspire public trust in immunization in immunization efforts and has been asked tasked with demystifying the regulatory process for the approval and monitoring of vaccines. So thank you so much for our COVID-19 leaders for being here today and being able to contribute your experiences and your perspective to today's panel discussion. So um, just before we present the first question to the panelists, please note that you can put any questions that you have for any of our leaders into the chat or send it directly to Samia and we will address all questions towards the end of the event. And now to start off the panel, we do have some questions prepared for our leaders, which will take about two and a half minutes each to share their thoughts, their experiences, and of course their experienced perspectives. So I'll ask the leaders to answer in a random order, but if you'd like to add on to one another, please feel free to do so and engage in that discussion. So um, to start off our panel event, I'll just pass it over to Warda, who will present to you the first question for today. Thank you, Shakti, so much. Uh, thank you so much for all. Thank you all so much for being here. There we go. I got that right. Um, thank you for all the work you do. It's so inspiring. And just to be here and share your stories is very very important and I look forward to the panel. So my first question is, how have you witnessed the pandemic impacting South Asians in your community? All right, so how about we start off with Dolly, Dolly Begum. Would you like to end? Thank you, Zaki, and thank you first uh, to CASA and to all the organizers, you guys have been doing a fantastic job as well, especially during this pandemic. I think that's what true leadership looks like uh, in our communities. And uh, during this pandemic, we have needed so much support, so much uh, support in every way, I think, uh, in every um, level, especially in our communities like Scarborough, where we have marginalized communities, we have low income um, pockets, and, and it's been tough for folks. So, so thank you for everything you do. I'm also very, very honored to be on this, uh, on, on this lineup of fantastic people that I have been looking up to. I have been so inspired by. Um, I know Dr. Uh, Dasani knows how much uh, I appreciate the work he does. I, I put it up on Twitter, same with Dr. Sinha. Um, it's, it's incredible uh, just watching, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's honestly, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be able to uh, sit here and, and, uh, and be on this panel. So thank you very, very much to CASA for that. Um, I, I have to say there's, there's different ways that our community has been impacted. When I look at the South Asian community in Scarborough, um, this is where I grew up. This is where I, uh, I have you know, gone to school. This is where I have, uh, I, I feel like my, you know, a, a dream of finally doing something uh, for the public, but in a, in a public space that I never thought I may actually be able to have that space uh, in the Ontario legislature. And I, I take that responsibility very seriously. And I, I'm, uh, I think I remind myself every single day what a privilege and an honor that is. Um, if folks remember, there's a few weeks back, we got uh, cancellation of appointments, about 10,000 cancellation of appointments. And many of those appointments were made by my office um, for folks who did not know how to access internet and how to uh, make those appointments. So we're talking about, you know, aunties and uncles, people who go into factories and work um, during this pandemic. Uh, it was heartbreaking for us to call some of these people back or as they were calling us because they didn't know whether their appointments were canceled or getting the notification. Um, and I wanna just give that example because I think it highlights what we have seen throughout this pandemic. The inequities, uh, the lack of access, uh, to healthcare, to support. Um, and during this pandemic, we have also seen how different communities are impacted uh, because of the social determinants of health and, and how you know, years of neglect in, in our communities that um, 
that leaves people behind. So if we, if I look at one part of my writing, if I know some of the buildings that that already have uh, people in low income, people who don't have uh, the space to isolate, they were impacted more. Um, I, and I've just taken way too much time. So I'm going to stop here because I, I think some of the other panelists will add on to a lot of the things that I have faced in Scarborough and across this, uh, this country, frankly speaking. Uh, so thank you very much. And I look forward to this conversation. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, Dr. Supriya Sharma, would you like to go next? She says that she's slow to get herself off mute. So um, just echoing what everyone has said, I'm just humbled to be um, with everybody today. You know, when, when I got the message that um, there was a poster, I was actually thinking that people were reaching out to me to see if I had suggestions on who could be on it. Because, you know, I think for a lot of us, during COVID, we're just we're doing our jobs. This is what we're this is what we're doing. This is what we do. this is what we've been training our entire lives for. And, and I think surrounded, um, we're surrounded by people that have just done you know exemplary work, and um, just exceedingly proud of the entire South Asian community everywhere from you know experts that have been called upon to um, speak directly through media to to people people in the community. I mean everything is local. So that have just risen to the occasion in the most trying of circumstances um, to get us through this unprecedented um, time. So just humble to be among all of you. And and you know I, I I'm in a unique position because you know at the at the federal level at the Health Canada level we're kind of at the thirty thousand foot level, right? So I mean everything is really local. Uh, it's where the rubber hits the road. Is where you know people are really feeling the effects. But we also have a role obviously to provide information um, from my perspective in Health Canada. Canada. It's on the vaccine uh, authorizations, therapies, making sure that other government programs are, are available to people and then they're communicated in, in that way. And then that gets handed off to, you know, other members of the community to then, um, to then, you know, disperse that within the community. So, I mean, I think from my perspective, and this has been sort of noted already, it's really you know, I think COVID is really, I think Sangha said it really well at the beginning that it was supposed to be the great equalizer, right? COVID at the beginning doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, where you live. It's, you know, it's, it's something that can affect us all. But what we found and what we know from all of the information on social determinants of health is that, you know, although we are all in the same ocean, we all have very different world and very different boats. And COVID has really unmasked uh, a lot of the inequities in the system, a lot of the realities that we're facing. But I think the other part of this for the South Asian community specifically is that I don't think we can talk about COVID-19 in Canada without also talking about what's happening in South Asia. And it is just, I, you know, when I'm talking to people that are not part of the community, I, I said, you just can't underestimate how much additional weight that is putting on people on a regular basis. Like I think all of us have, you know, either lost family members or um, friends, um, you know, in the last, in the, in the last while, I cannot, I've lost count of the number of times that I've heard from people that they're scared to look at their phone because of just the news that they might get. So I think, you know, beyond what everyone else is dealing with um, in Canada, I think this added, reality, this horrific reality that we're all facing um, has really, you know, put that extra challenge on us at, at the end of a, hopefully close to the end of a very, very long period of time. So I think that's just extra, um, I think extra commendation for people that have risen to the occasion, not only here, but then also helping people halfway across, across the world. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Um, would, uh, Dr. Samir Sinha, would you like to Share your thoughts. Sure, I just want to echo. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for 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 welcoming me to be a part of uh, um, a great group of uh, people that I admire, um, young and uh, and experienced. I'll say it that way. Um, uh, who've really been kind of. Um, I think as one of our colleagues just said before, we're just doing our jobs, but you realize how important this work really is, especially for our community, um, just for the points that people were saying, you know, again, as, as um, 
as is being said, you know, we were told of this being a great equalizer, but as a geriatrician, as a doctor that, that specializes in the care of older people, you know, I quickly started seeing the data right from the beginning saying that when it comes to older people, this is nowhere near the great equalizer, that even while a lot of our attention is shifted now to say, what about the younger people becoming affected with COVID? We have to remind that in Ontario right now, you know, in the last week alone, in the last month alone, 90% of the people who are still dying are older people, 16 older. Um, and when you start looking at not only is it been older people who've been most, um, most affected, but then we are start seeing all those other layers of diversity that start really mattering. Um, and so for Dolly and other colleagues, especially in our regions where we have a larger representation of South Asian people, it's not just because of, um, it's not mainly ethnicity, but it's all those social determinants of health, you know, that colleagues like Nahid and others around, again, the Zoom room have really been focusing on the idea that, um, you know, the, the color of our skin, our heritage might also reflect the roles, responsibilities, the privileges or the lack of privileges we have, and why it's been so important to make sure that we do that extra work um, that is needed. Um, to not only, in my view, support older people, but I always think that whenever I'm thinking about my advocacy for older people, it's always been, what about those extra things that make, say, for an older person, it even more difficult, you know, for our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents, you know, to access those vaccines to get that support. Um, I was just on a call earlier today with the folks from Toronto Public Health, because, again, I, I have a role where I'm chairing the City of Toronto Senior Strategy. I co-chair that with Councillor Matlow. And one of the challenges that we have is when we look, you know, right now we're talking about, isn't a great 80% of people in Ontario and across Canada who are older people have gotten their first shot. But actually, when you look at the data in Toronto, it's only about 70%. Right. So we're actually 10 percent less than our provincial or our national average. And there's a real gap there. And, and my colleagues at Toronto Public Health are saying, Dr. Sinna, what are the extra things that we need to think about? And of course, Toronto is a great diverse city. But I know that for my patients and, and from Dolly's constituents and others you know, who are calling in, we've got folks who cannot navigate a website in English or French, for example, easily. Um, literacy might be a problem, for example. Um, they might not be aware. I pressured a lot of government early on to say, can you make sure that that hotline is available in 300 languages of choice? Um, and sadly, it was only through the media that we finally got that pressure put on to make sure that we actually were recognizing the diversity and those barriers um, that really can kind of limit that access and discourage people, especially when they don't have the luxury of time to sit on a computer because they're busy working um, and, and, and trying to do so many other things. So I think if anything, you know, I think throughout, you know, my career, I think for so many of us, we've, we've been particularly more um, cognizant of the fact that um, health equity means working harder uh, for people who, um, you know, there's a term someone used recently saying, why do we call these equity seeking communities as if it's them who, you know, are looking for equity when they should actually be considered equity deserving communities. And the idea that those understanding those inequities are things that I've you know, tried to put an extra layer of effort in. I know everybody around um, this table today has been doing that work. And I think it's important that we continue raising that voice because otherwise we are leaving people behind. And that's not the Canada or the country that we're trying to create. Um, it's one that when we see an ocean that's not treating people equally, um, that we actually do our work to make sure that everyone can be treated as well as they need to be. So um, again, a real privilege to be here with so many people that I admire and respect um, and, uh, and, and, and really just uh, uh, want to share just some of those reflections on how, um, uh, you know, I've kind of been feeling over the last, uh, the last year in particular. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I really like your um, analogy to the ocean, but um, thanks, Dr. Sinha. Um, Dr. Nahid Dosani, would you like to go next? 
Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, and echoing the sentiments, Casa, you guys are awesome. It's really great to, to be here on this panel with such incredible people. I can't wait to virtually hug you all very soon. Um, I, I do really um, think about this question and I think that the, the, the work and the experience of South Asian peoples and, the, and our communities uh, was at the, at the forefront of COVID-19 in Canada in many, many places and in many ways. I think I'm just gonna jump Jump into a few ways that really hit home for me. You know, my colleagues have talked about how this was not an equal equal opportunity virus. It certainly highlighted inequities, but it also perpetuated them. And it and we live in a world where we're very comfortable talking about race as a as a as a determinant of health, but it's really racism that's the determinant of healthcare outcomes, not race. And um, we we are very comfortable talking about diversity, but we're very un uncomfortable talking about anti racism. And really, you know, we really want to cut at the core of what happen in this country to South Asian communities, we really have to talk about these issues. And, and, and we have to go back in time, you know, it's almost surreal to think, you know, just over a year ago, we had political leaders, um, policymakers who were telling us that we didn't even need to collect race-based data because it's all affecting us all equally. You know, in the first round of data in Toronto showed that 83% of people who are getting COVID were racialized, 70% were, uh, who were hospitalized were racialized. And that hasn't really changed actually. And black and brown uh, communities, people of color have been hit especially hard. Um, and you know, this has really hit home for me in a few roles as a street outreach doctor providing palliative care and healthcare for people experiencing homelessness, but also as the medical director for the Regional Appeals COVID-19 Isolation and Housing Program, where um, you know, it's important to say that homelessness affects the South Asian community, just like it does every other community in Canada. And sometimes we, we act like we're immune, we're uncomfortable with these topics. And I know Casa does incredible work in, in breaking down stigma and raising awareness. And I thought this was an appropriate time to say South Asian people live on the streets and in shelters, not just in Peel, but in many places as well. And, you know, this is a very sick population. They're 28 times more likely to have hepatitis C, five times more likely to have heart disease, four times more likely to have cancer. And when COVID hit, they were hit even harder. We know that people experiencing homelessness in Ontario were 20 times more likely to be hospitalized, five times more likely um, to die from COVID-19 and 10 times more likely to be in ICU. We also saw how COVID-19 hit essential workers really hard in the South Asian community. There've been many folks living in multi-generational households um, who really were just trying to pay their bills and had to choose between their health and paying their bills. And we also saw how vaccine inequity became a real concern um, um, uh, in, a, in a province, I'm in Ontario, where a per capita approach to distribution basically left many of the hardest hit communities out, including Scarborough, including Peel. And, um, you know, we were told for so long, these communities are vaccine hesitant. We got to do all these sessions. I was worried too. So I jumped on a bunch of town halls, did dozens of them in multiple languages, vaccine town halls, vaccine hesitancy. And then you saw what happened. The lineups were going around the block, lasting several minutes. Um, it wasn't vaccine hesitancy. It was vaccine confidence with structural discrimination and inequitable access to vaccines. We can't forget that. So we saw the need for advocacy on multiple um, fronts and it's really a full circle experience for the entire um, South Asian community. Um, I, I, I encourage people to think of an apple tree and, and um, you know, uh, my colleague, Dr. Nanki Rai um, uses this diagram in her teaching and it really hits home for me to think that the apples are the product of a really good healthcare system, life expectancy, neonatal outcomes, morbidity, mortality, and think of the branches of the trees as social determinants of health, income, employment, social networks, so on and so forth. And why is it that some communities have really great social determinants of health and others don't? We're really comfortable talking about the branches. We're not comfortable talking about the roots. And until we talk about you know, racism, until we talk about xenophobia, transphobia, ableism, capitalism, and really you know, these, these, these factors of society systemic discrimination, we will never get at the core of what health equity means. I think in this pandemic, we saw a health system that was really good at equality, giving people the same things to be happy and healthy. It wasn't so good at equity, giving people what they needed to be happy and healthy. And we certainly did not see many examples of justice where people were given the resources and, and tools to make their own healthy lifestyle choices in the ways that they needed, when they needed it, how they needed it, where they needed it. And I dream of a world where we move from health equality to equity to health justice, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dasani. Some very um, important information you highlighted. 
Um, I want to now introduce um, or give it over to our youth leaders that we have here today. So I'll start off with Sukmeet. Thank you so much for having me and to be on a platform with all these role models that I've been following for so long. Uh, Dr. Sina, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Dasani, like I've been following your work for so long. It's amazing. Uh, it's so nice to be on a panel um, with so many diverse voices and so many diverse experiences and backgrounds. So thank you so much for including me as a part of this. And as someone mentioned before as well, I would really like to acknowledge that while we are here uh, being recognized, I think it's important for us to recognize every single person who's out there doing work in the South Asian community and other communities across the world to help end this pandemic. This pandemic, like has already been mentioned, has highlighted a lot of the disparities and the inequities that are present in our system. And I think it's so important, all the work that we're doing to try to help stop these from happening. So the work that I started was really from a simple interaction. I went to the Gurdwara one day and over there, I went with my dad, went inside and I saw that a lot of the elders in my community were not wearing a mask. And this was shocking to me because Dr. Bonnie Henry, who's our provincial uh, public health officer was doing daily briefings every day, uh, educating the public about wearing masks, about socially distancing but this wasn't really relating to the community level. And so I asked one of these people, I asked Uncle Jithusi, Kyo, uh, mask ni paya? And that means like, how come you're not wearing a mask? And he told me, he's like, well, there isn't a mask that's available in the market for me. It's because our turbans are covering our ears. And so the regular mask that can tie around in, uh, their ears cannot be fit around a turban. And so this was something that I recognized. And I was like, you know what? I have to do something about this. I got my master of public health degree before. So I had the uh, educational background in order to create something. And so as a medical student as, a, as well, I saw all of the physician preceptors that I have that were in the hospital day and night trying to fight COVID. And I knew I had to do something about this. While I can't be in the hospital helping out right now, I knew that I could help try to eliminate people from even going to the hospital in the first place. And so I reached to the local Gurdwara and I told them that I would like to uh, do a public health awareness campaign where we can help educate our seniors in Punjabi, in Hindi and different languages about COVID-19 so that it can be easier for them to understand what is happening. And so the Gurdwara was on board. They were really excited that there were youth that were out there that wanted to do this. And they literally opened up the entire space for us to work on this initiative. I contacted the local health authority as well, Fraser Health, uh, who are already facing a disproportionately higher rate of COVID-19. And our community here in Surrey has one of the highest rates of COVID-19 in all of Canada. And it's predominantly South Asian population. And so we were seeing a lot of different things happening at the same time. For one, once the, once the virus first started, people were starting to blame the Chinese communities, for instance. And then as the virus progressed, I saw in my community of Surrey, people were trying to target uh, Punjabi people, Hindu people, et cetera, so forth in the South Asian community. It was really bothering me. I even did media interviews and I kid you not, I had one media interview that wanted me to basically say, um, it is the South Asians that are to blame for the high rates of COVID-19. And I didn't give them the answer that I, they wanted and they never aired the interview, which I'm glad that they didn't. Uh, but basically it was just really shocking just to hear all these myths that were out there. People didn't realize how come South Asians have a high rate of COVID-19. It's not because that uh, they are more prone to getting or anything. It's more so because of like how Dr. Dasani just described it, the intergenerational housing, for instance. I know so many people, if one person gets it, everyone in the entire family can get it. Most people in my community are essential workers who have to go to work. I know like my dad, for instance, he has to go to work in order to, you know, sustain our family. And so I think these are things that oftentimes the media forgets, people forget, and they start to play a blame game. And so I really wanted to create a simple intervention in our local Gurdwara, uh, where we educated the public on mass distribution about how, why it's important to wear a mask, uh, when you should wash it, how you should store it. Very simple things that we, for, my, for instance, might take for granted. We taught the public about how to wash your hands properly because even as a medical student, you wouldn't believe, like there's a lot of people who don't know how to wash their hands. And so we were educating the public on that. And last thing we were educating the public was on physical distancing. 
And this I found to be the most tough thing to do because as humans, we all love to be together. We love to interact with each other. And especially the Gurdwar is a place of worship where people come there to meet their friends, to have a spiritual place where they can hang out with others. And now this was being taken away from them. And so I knew that the Gurdwar is a place where people come for their mental well-being. And especially during a time where a pandemic is on the rise, people need a sense of belonging. And so we tried to make this happen in the Gurdwara. And I guess I can share the details later, but it was really successful. And it was amazing just to see the positivity um, in the elders and thanking them about us educating them uh, about COVID-19. I think that all the work that we've been doing in this uh, group over here is very important. And I think we should never let hate drown any of that out as we just witnessed right now. I think we should continue to use platforms like this to empower ourselves, empower others around us and give ourselves and others a voice. Thanks so much for sharing and thank you also for the work you did in your community. Um, I'll turn it over to now Fairuz. Fairuz. Hey, yes, sorry, I have my video off. Um, my internet is a bit unstable right now and it's been that way throughout the day, but hopefully I can, um, it'll come back soon. Um, I also wanted to echo a lot of what's already been said by the other panelists. Um, I'm really honored to be here today, um, especially I, I just finished my undergraduate degree at McMaster, so it's really an honor to be here with all of these amazing individuals on the panel um, and knowing all of the, the incredible work that you've done within the community. Um, and I would also like to thank CASA for the grassroots level work that you've been doing to, to create these conversations, these important um, dialogue. And um, I just really thank you. I guess I wanted to um, touch upon a little bit about what Sukmeet was mentioning about how South Asian community has really been vilified throughout the pandemic um, about the about driving up higher rates of COVID-19. But we know that from everything that um, the other panelists were mentioning, it's about this limited and inequitable access to the social determinants of health, which is translating into um, poor health outcomes, but it's also about the inadequate access to care and the lack of um, policies and culturally competent care to address health concerns within our community. And it's also about the discrimination and exclusion and racism and what we've just heard um, throughout this panel as well, um, and which has continued to perpetuate this per and throughout the pandemic. And part of what I've been doing has been to talk about the in um, the lack of public washrooms um, and how that's become a greater issue during the pandemic. Um, a, a segment of our population that's been disproportionately um, been impacted by the lack of public washrooms are our frontline workers, the, those in the um, service industry, those who are working in the gig economy and um, South Asian uh, and racialized individuals were disproportionately and overrepresented um, in precarious jobs in the service industry and the gig economy, making um, South Asian individuals more largely vulnerable to, contract, to contracting COVID-19 as well. Um, so when we're talking about our frontline workers and the lack of accessible, safe, and inclusive public washrooms, it, it means that there's a lack of space for these individuals to um, maintain their safety and their personal hygiene, which puts them um, also at risk of, for gig workers, for example, of um, having to hold in their urine for longer than they should be, which is leading to other health concerns like urinary tract infections, which are uh, dangerous for your health as well. Um, so we're seeing that the lack of public washrooms is an issue that's um, not only disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable, in our communities and that's including but not limited to those experiencing homelessness, the aging population, families with young children, those who menstruate, those who are pregnant, those with disabilities, transgender individuals, um, women and frontline workers. So 
um, it's in these ways that we're seeing that this is a highly intersectional, intersectional issue and it's become more of an issue because of COVID-19, but it's always been here. Um, but there's work that needs to be done to address the issue. Um, public washroom access isn't just a, is a basic human right that's not being upheld. Um, and it's not only about providing individuals within our community about with safety and hygiene, but it's also about um, upholding dignity, being able to access or not having to think about um, washroom access has a lot to do with toilet privilege. Not having access to public washrooms is really marginalizing, but it's a highly stigmatized topic and it's not spoken about. Um, not everyone has the ability to work from home, as I was mentioning earlier, and what other individuals have um, touched upon today, and the lack of inclusive paid sick leave as well means that individuals who are working on the front line right now or who has to plan their day around where they can find public washrooms creates a lot of stress and it creates a lot of mental pressure if there isn't that safe and accessible and inclusive public washroom. So it's again, it's a highly intersectional issue and it's one that also impacts our mental well-being. So we're seeing impacts to our physical health, but also our mental health um, when we're thinking about the levels of stress and anxiety that come around the inability to access public washrooms. Um, so that's a bit about what I have been trying to um, work on through the Hamlet Washrooms um, social media campaign to bring light to this issue. Thank you, Frederick. That was great. Um, and again, want, sorry for all the interruptions, um, but just to revisit the question for our, our new attendees who joined in, we had asked the panelists, how have you, wit how have you witnessed a pandemic impacting South Asians in your community? So we're just now going to move on to our second question, which will be presented by another member of CASA, Tamil. Tamil, would you like to share the question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, detailed responses from you all. Uh, here is a question for you. Can you share one of the most profound stories you have come across and witnessed during this pandemic that had an impact on you and your work? Awesome. So now we'll, so I'm just picking in a random order. Um, I wanted to see if we could start off with our youth candidate. So Sukmeet, would you like to start off? Sure. So thank you so much for that question. Uh, I think I've had many positive experiences and heard so many different stories uh, throughout this past year. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, when we started, act, um, started this project in the Gurdwara, the elders were so appreciative that there were youth that were stepping in to help uh, bridge the divide between uh, the intergenerational uh, age gap. And I think that was something that was amazing. And just hearing them speak in Punjabi with us and in Hindi and just describing the gratitude that they had, that there was someone out there in the community that was willing to sacrifice their weekends to help educate them. I think that was something that was really powerful for them. Now, fast forward to a year later, I've been really advocating now to get uh, vaccine clinics happening in Gurdwaras and in other places of worship so that we can have a more equitable and, and more um, reliable system for giving the vaccines. Just recently, uh, a month ago actually, but Fraser Health just released the video yesterday, I vaccinated a hundred year old Punjabi woman and it was the most amazing feeling ever because they came together, three generations, the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter and they all came together wanting to do one thing, which was to inspire people around them to go get vaccinated. And so I had the opportunity to vaccinate her. And while I was giving her the vaccine, she spoke to me in Punjabi and she was telling me about how grateful she is to be getting the vaccine when there's so many people in places like India who are not able to get the vaccine. She was blessing me for doing the work that I'm doing to vaccinate people. And she just wanted to inspire people. It was amazing to see that fire within a hundred year old woman who was just so excited, full of life. And she was just like, you know what? If the media wants to record me, please do. If anyone wants to record me, I just want the message to go out to everyone to go get vaccinated. And I think that was just so inspiring. And then we also recently, finally, we had a vaccine clinic at the Gurdwara last Friday. And it was just amazing. Again, we had over 400 people come in and there was one woman specifically who is so scared of needles. And she's like, 
I would not have come uh, and ha been vaccinated at all if it wasn't in the Gurdwara. She's like, this is a place where I feel uh, welcomed, I feel safe. And when, <laughs> when I was about to give her her vaccine, she was so scared, but she kept chanting our guru's name. And she was like, you know what, that really helped calm her down. And she was able to get her vaccine. And she's like, I will tell all my friends and all my family, whoever are scared to uh, get the vaccine to now come into the Gurdwara and get the vaccine. So there's a positive story. That's awesome. That's such a sweet story. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Fairuz, would you like to share a story? Thank you so much. Um, so for me, um, it's been the um, the impact that the lack of public washrooms has had on those who have been experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity during the pandemic. Um, when I first started to learn more about this issue and to think more about this issue, I was we were I was noticing public health very important public health messaging has been um, to stay at home and to wash our hands and um, practice hand hygiene but that's not always the reality for all parts of our population especially when we think about the inequitable access to public washrooms there isn't that space for us to access running water or soap or um, um, to practice that hand hygiene. And that reveals a stark social inequity. Um, and what's more shelters um, within Hamilton, um, as well as Toronto were experiencing, last summer were experiencing a lot of overcrowding. And that meant that the ability to social distance wasn't there, which was also revealing another social inequality. Um, and through the work that um, and discussions that I was having with um, a community partner at the YWCA Hamilton, as well as um, Dr. Kate Whalen from McMaster, um, we were talking about how um, the placing portable washrooms within our communities to um, increase public washroom access is good, but it's not the the only solution. We it's a short term answer, but we need these long term sustainable solutions that will help to maintain um, the public health of our community. Um, I was, I had the privilege of being able to work with the McMaster Research Shop and the Beasley Neighborhood Association, which is a, um, which is a, the Beasley Neighborhood is in Hamilton. And we uh, were able to conduct an environmental scan of uh, public washroom initiatives within North America, as well as a very interesting one in Japan. Um, and there's a lot of really amazing, sustainable, safe and inclusive public washroom models that are out there. Um, and, but there's a lack of um, action that's being taken by our local governments here in Ontario and Hamilton, specifically in Toronto as well. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with the general manager from the White Avenue public washroom pilot, which is in Edmonton. Um, and there we were talking about how um, public, the public washroom that they created was very important, especially during the pandemic for individuals who were experiencing homelessness within that community and that how those individuals are often overlooked when um, there were discussions that were happening about how we can um, support the community during COVID. Um, but it was really just these conversations were really just a wake up call of how there needs to be greater investment in our community for um, affordable housing, but also basic infrastructure like public washrooms. Awesome. Thank you, Farooz, for sharing. Uh, Dr. Nahid Dosani, would you like to share a story with us? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, these stories are so inspiring. I think the power of narrative is so key. We talk so much about numbers and data. We throw out stats till we're numb in the brain and the heart. But I think it's really the narrative that really gets us, um, mo moves us. Um, mine's a two-part story. It's actually two different individuals and experiences, but they 
they really combine. It was really early on in the pandemic when we were building up the isolation housing program in the region of Peel, where I started to realize that the statement, just stay home, was a statement of privilege. It was very clear to me that there was a proportion of the population that was able to stay home, had housing, had income, had social networks, but it was even, um, even further than that. And that's when I start, really started to realize that our labor, our work conditions is a determinant of health. And I still remember admitting a gentleman who was working in a production plant in Peel um, to the COVID recovery program, one of these hotels that we had set up, but it wasn't just him. I had, we had admitted his entire family, seven people. And I remember him sitting at a chair and just his, ha his head was in his hands and he felt so upset and so angry and so sad that he had um, chosen to work instead of staying home um, and because he chose to work he spread COVID-19 to his family now of course that wasn't you know so that's the way he said it to me and I and I'll never forget trying to say it back to him and say well hold on this isn't necessarily your fault the fact that you have to work the fact that you have to pay your bills in the middle of a pandemic when we have policy options that can be put in place to protect you and your family that's not your fault and just even the like way that the, the like a light bulb went on in that moment like he didn't realize that that would have been an option really spoke to me about the importance around advocacy around you know in, in instituting and implementing paid sick leave, um, for example, and other labor conditions that would have really helped um, essential workers everywhere. But, you know, I was working in Peel, and so I was really thinking about that at the time. I have the unique privilege of working in, in community and healthcare, but also in hospital. So fast forward just a few weeks later, and I, I'm a palliative care doctor, and I'm doing a consultation in the ICU for a ventilated uh, patient who's dying of COVID-19. And I'll never forget, you know, conducting the assessment and supporting the family through a very difficult circumstance. Um, and I remember, you know, um, his, his daughter saying, you know, my, my dad is dying because he didn't have paid sick leave. You know that, right? He died because he didn't have paid sick leave. Fast forward to now, I've now met so many people who got sick and, and even died due to a lack of, of, due to policy failure because our governments and the systems around us um, didn't deem their lives valuable enough to support them. It was not until the third wave that we started to get serious around interventions like paid sick leave. And even then only ended up with a paid sick leave plan that supports three days for a virus that, uh, that, that you're required to isolate for a minimum of 10. People were, uh, our politicians played politics with people's lives. Um, and, and, and I'll never forget um, um, these two stories and the power of narrative and the power of these two families and what they went through and how a single policy choice, if made upstream, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic would have made such a difference. It would have saved lives, it would have protected families. There would be so many, uh, so, so there would be a lot less broken hearts or, um, around you know, the region of Peel and many other, other regions. And uh, we would have a collective com community that would be shared in humanity. I think, um, I think these are two stories that really speak to me um, and really bring forth how our political decisions and our policy choices are so important, not just in a pandemic, but all the time. I This has inspired me to continue advocacy around labor issues and labor as a determinant of, of health outcomes. I encourage folks to check out Health Providers Against Poverty, the Decent Work and Health Network, two organizations I've allied with throughout COVID-19 to, to be that guiding light around these issues. And I hope we'll continue to fight this, this important fight. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for that hard hitting story and your work, Dr. Dosani. Um, Dr. Samir Sinha, would you like to go next and share a story with us? Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Um, I think, you know, all of us have had really profound experiences that I think have just kind of galvanized and made us work harder, um, you know, for, for, you know, just to really try and fight injustice and, and you know, in that way. Um, and again, you know, my perspective always comes, you know, first as a geriatrician where I've dedicated my lives to care for caring for older people. Um, and as we talked about earlier, when you started realizing that the majority of the people who are, you know, getting sick and dying were older people, and especially in long-term care, you know, I, you know, I said, you know, what are the tools that I have in my toolbox, you know, in terms of how can I advocate, how can I support? Um, 
And I think, you know, I, I think it was early in March of last year, I wrote an op-ed with a colleague of mine um, in the Globe and Mail saying that, you know, the, the, you know, COVID is not the only thing to go viral during this pandemic, ageism has too. Um, and it was really speaking to, you know, again, so these, you know, the opportunity that, you know, decision makers do have the power to make decisions, um, to implement policies, just like Nahid was talking about paid sick leave. I mean, it seems like a no brainer, but you start realizing that underlying our decisions are our values and who we care about and who we don't care about. Um, and that was very hard for me because, you know, I like to believe over time that, you know, advocacy and, and, and moving forward as a country that, you know, that ageism, for example, racism, these sorts of things aren't really things anymore that we like we've matured as a society. And then, and then you see in situations like this where these things become quite apparent, you see where the lines are drawn. And I think at that point, I think for all of us, you know, we can choose to, you know, say, I guess that's what it is, or, or we just fight harder. And I think you're hearing uh, from an incredible panel of people who, you know, who've done, you know, who've chosen to fight harder and, and try and really correct those injustices and so on. Um, and I remember, you know, facing so many of these instances where I would hear political leaders. I remember the Premier of Alberta one day saying that, well, the average person dying of COVID is two years older than the average life expectancy of an Albertan. And I thought, is that an observation? Or are you basically saying that some people, you know, I mean, if people are dying and they're older, are their lives expendable? I remember early on when long-term care homes around the city of Toronto were starting to, um, you know, really have, you know, care collapsing. I was on the phone with agencies and groups and, um, and, and trying to find, you know, um, folks who could help out. And I remember even talking to a senior leader at one of the hospitals and saying, you know, you're next door to one of these homes, you know, maybe, you know, what, you know, I can help advise, you know, support you to help. And all they said back to me was someone should help them. And I said, shouldn't that be you? right? Like, shouldn't it be us? You know, why aren't we doing this sort of stuff? And I remember even going up to the level of speaking to ministers and saying, you know, um, you know, them saying, well, it's sad what's happening, but what, what else can we do? And I said, this is when you actually have the power to compel hospitals, compel, get the military involved. And, and these were, you know, again, it was fascinating to hear responses saying, well, you know, should we do this or do that? And what really troubled me throughout all of this was that hearing statements or things that were that were basically placing, you know, um, issues that, you know, some lives aren't worth, you know, others, um, or that, you know, we can think about this as an unavoidable tragedy when so much of this was avoidable if we actually did the things that we needed to do. So, I mean, it was a recurring theme that struggled with, but I think all it did was just made me resolve to try and advocate harder, um, to try and figure out when you when you meet a barrier, what are the other ways you can do? Um, and I think you know, you know, I looked always to Nahid for inspiration amongst others here about you know the power of social media um, and how to get that message out and how to find allies and how to and 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 I think a lot of us around around the Zoom room, for example have been inspired by each other. I mean, it helps when, you know, again, you can't, not everyone can do everything, but together we can do a lot. Um, and we've all been able to focus on different aspects, but really all around the same issue. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of profound moments when um, I think there are times when I've been driven to tears, um, when I've seen such levels of injustice occur. But, um, but I'm really proud that frankly, if a lot of us, you know, here, didn't do what we did and didn't keep that resolve and keep fighting, um, that probably there'd be a lot more injustice that could have occurred. Um, and so I think, you know, it's hard to always look back and say, what were the positive things? There have been positives for sure. When you see people rallying together and people becoming friends and supporting each other and rallying there, but we have to, we'll have to take a look back at this and say, why did we not make decisions? You know, what, what were those values? that were maybe underpinning a lack of action um, or other actions that haven't been helpful. Um, and I think that'll be helpful because I think, you know, this won't be our last pandemic ahead of us and there will be other challenges, but I think we've learned a lot about who we are as a society and where we need to improve. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Sinha. And 
Um, going back to your point and Dr. Dosani's point about the power of social media over the last year, I think it's just been an evident fact how important that's become in conveying public health information over the past year. So um, thank you. Dr. Supriya Sharma, would you like to go next and share a story with us? No, because that's a, those are really hard acts to follow. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, at the federal level, obviously, at the policy level, it's a bit different because we're making decisions on the population um, side of things. We're talking, you're thinking about 39 million people all at the same time. Um, but the profound impact, is, as Dr. Sinha had said, of the human stories really stay with you, both on the positive side, these, you know, whether it's random acts of kindness, whether it's like both Faroos and Sukhmeet, like reaching out and seeing a, something in their communities and doing something about it, um, you know, all the way to just individual stories that are just incredibly heartbreaking. So, I mean, I think stories on the, on the, on the positive end. So for example, you know, we're working on the vaccine side of things. We started back in January, 2020, getting ourselves ready, working internationally where there's like a group of 36 countries. We're working with the WHO. We're like knee deep in all of the science. It is like miraculous what has happened. Um, and, you know, one vaccine submission can be 100,000 pages. It's 2000 person hours, like we've put teams together. Um, and then, you know, you do all of that, you do all the, the, the analysis, and then somebody sends you a selfie of, uh, of somebody who's in, you know, Peel in uh, a hot zone, um, and who's now vaccinated because of that, or the hundred you know, year old baby who was there and rolling up her sleeves and getting her vaccine. So I think those stories were just, are just they're so important to, to hold with us because that's obviously why we're doing things. Um, and then there's the stories in the other end of the spe spectrum. So I remember very early on, um, you know, we were rolling out federal programs like one after another. And, and there was a, a real spirit at the, at the government of Canada level of a whole of government and you know don't let the perfect get in the way of the productive let it let's kind of get out there and get the the policies out there so you know the focus was really on um you know people that potentially had lost their jobs um essential service uh workers that that had to be on the front lines people then were shifting to working from home and i remember um the personal story of a of a young south asian woman um, who was sharing her personal story. And it was one of, um, you know, she had a job, she was able to work from home, but she was also living in a multi-generational home and she was, you know, the victim of, of domestic violence. And she, her, her workplace was a lifeline for her. And I remember that so profoundly affecting me because A, it is just that, you know, a lot of us are in such a position of privilege in, in so many ways. So whatever we are going through for the year pales in comparison to what so, so many other people are, are going through. But it was just this chilling concept of, of you know, even, for those of us who are lucky enough to have a roof overhead, have this place where home is safety to us, right? It is a place where we were, you know, there was so much fear at the beginning um, of, of infection. We were still learning, there was all this unknown, but you know, when you stepped into your home, there was this sense of security and safety and this woman didn't have that. So I think it, you know, it was really a reminder that, you know, we're all living in different realities that whatever policies and things that we put into place, whatever scenarios we're thinking of, there are other ones, right? And we need to make sure that we know those stories that we reach out to communities we understand where people are coming from and then work towards, um, you know, together, whether it's the federal level, provincial, territorial, regional level to put in policies to be able to float, you know, all of those boats. And, and again, I think cer certain things worked, certain things did not work. There were gaps. And, you know, when we get through all of this, which we will, um, you know, to do a really good look back at what worked and, and what didn't. And I think people, you know, sort of say, you know, will people really get back to normal? Will we be able to do that? My fears are, are the opposite. You know, if you look back to other times in Canada when we've gone through crises, whether they've been infectious disease related or not, um, memories are really short. And, you know, we're very quick to kind of go on to 
the next thing, um, there's, you know, a, a, a dearth of investments into public health because those are long term investments. They, they tend not to be the, the, the burning platforms that we need to deal with. So, you know, what I've said to people is that remember these stories, like remember these individuals, remember how those stories made you feel. Remember when we were in the thick of it, how, you know, profoundly we were all uh, impacted and remember and carry that energy as we go forward um, to learn from this experience and then put other structural changes in place so that we, you know, we don't live through this again. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dolly Begum, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks. Um, I, there is so many beautiful stories. I feel like I was kind of reflecting on, on throughout the year um, and, and this is sort of a healthy conversation, I think, for all of us, if, we all, if the rest of them will agree, um, because I don't think we've had a chance to talk about some of the things that we have felt and, and gone through. And, and, uh, and as Dr. Sharma was talking about it now, I just felt like, you know, there is there is moments that we kind of look back and and, and it is absolutely uh, incredible. And I think sometimes even I myself have to kind of stand back and think that we have gone through more than a year now. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, if I were to think of so many, oh my God, there's, <laughs> there are so many moments that I look back and I wonder, uh, I, I don't think I would have uh, felt that we would get through it. Um, I, I, for me, everything that I do comes from a very sort of personal space. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I, um, I, I never imagined being a, a politician or a public representative during COVID. Um, so it's, it's been quite an incredible journey. Uh, and it's, and, and as, as you know, my first term, just kind of learning um, the uh, pieces in the legislature, COVID hit. Uh, so when one of the first things that happened um, was my dad takes transit. He takes the TTC, he's, um, he's legally blind, uh, so he cannot uh, drive. And he, he's, when his license was revoked, it was one of the heartbreaking things that I have ever seen uh, uh, grown men get the letter and, and that, that emotion. So for him, every single doctor's appointment or every urgent you know, thing that he had to do, if I'm at work or if my brother's at work, um, that means he has to take the TTC and do that. Um, and there are times that we have situations where even if you're asked to stay home, you do have to go out and and uh, and do that for yourself. Um, so I kept telling him, "Don't go out, don't go out." Um, and and there are some certain things that I just couldn't stop. And I was really, really afraid of, of what's going to happen. And I think there is a lot of people that, um, and, and it, I think it just brought it home for me in terms of the the level of, uh, you know, the risk that people face, especially our essential workers face. Um, because my dad's not an essential worker. He, he was just going to his doctor's appointment and I was afraid of him taking the TTC. And, and when you now, you take that to the level of everyday people who have to go out there and then come back to their whole family, to their grandparents, parents, kids. Um, it is abs it's beyond, um, I, I mean, I can't imagine what their mental health will be, just, to, just imagining um, what kind of risk they're facing. Um, the countless conversations I've had with so many people who are out there in their workplaces that are unsafe. Um, I've had just the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things I've, uh, I was uh, battling with the government for, which was um, a, a huge number of workers, mainly women, mainly racialized South Asian women who were fired from their workplace, which was deemed essential, by the way, uh, a factory that's deemed essential, which in my opinion, I don't think is essential. Um, and it was deemed essential. They were asked, they were actually threatened that they will be fired. And when they were taken advantage of, after a few months of that, in the middle of the pandemic, they were fired, quite a few of them. And it was just heartbreaking to see the, the I think the policy failures um, within uh, all levels of government and the lack of inspections in terms of um, in these workplaces and uh, the safety risk that people were talking about. And for me, it was very personal, whether it was my family or my community. And, uh, and, and there are a few steps that we started taking. Um, and recently, I, I can give you an example of the TTC workers that we got vaccinated. And it was incredible because um, I, I just could not fathom how they were not a priority. It, it, it did not make any sense to me, uh, but we decided, and I'm, I'm so incredibly proud, actually, I was listening to um, Sukmeet and, and Fairuz. Um, you know, Fairuz, one of the things that I was listening to about taxi drivers, 
who, by the way, use TTC um, subway station public washrooms. And during the pandemic, they don't have the ability to do that because the public washrooms are locked up. And it was, it's it just the, the, the hurdle it created. I don't think policymakers sometimes understand that, especially, and, and I speak for myself and, and a lot of the, my colleagues, that you have to really break it down to them to you know, make them realize what's going on and how there are pieces that we have to connect together. Um, and so, so I, I'm, I'm really lucky that I have an incredible team that's been working so hard and we were able to get a lot of people vaccinated, a lot of people the support that they needed. Um, just this past week, we had about 600 TTC workers vaccinated um, and we're working to get even more uh, because we just kind of took it, up, took it upon ourselves to find health teams that were willing to come to us and help us um, and, and then provide the, that sort of connection. Um, but it's it's just remarkable that there are, there are, I think those gaps that we have to fill and we have to make sure that people are protected in that sense. I mean, there's you know people talked about uh, paid sick leave. Um, we talked about long term care, which is another thing that I think I have had profound moments that I will never forget. Um, there is a young woman named Vijita that I've been talking to, and I think she's sort of my the the moment where something turned. And it was, it, it went from, the, you know, advocacy, here's the fight we have to fight, to anger or rage where we needed to do something. And I remember it was in the beginning of the pandemic where we had a PSW call us and say, my husband's in the ICU. And, and my staff were kind of confused, like, why is your husband in the ICU? Like, you're the one who caught COVID. And, and the fact that she caught COVID at the long-term care home that she was working at, and her husband was in the ICU. Um, and it was a scary story for her. Um, we had to deal with the long-term care home that's, uh, that's in Scarborough, um, as well as what she was going through. And it was extremely painful, I think, because even today, we're still fighting that fight. Uh, the fact that we still don't have enough paid sick leave, um, I'm sure you've seen, we have proposed it over 20 times in the legislature, and unfortunately, it, it got, has gotten, um, uh, it has failed more than 20 times. And I think the, the proposal was not what was necessary. And I, I'm, I have to say, uh, it's incredibly powerful when we have leaders, especially the, the doctors who have spoken out and, and the panelists here, who have actually come out on national television, for example, and talked about what are some of those pieces look like. And, and that was really, really powerful because it actually helped the arguments um, we, we quote all of you when we talk in the legislature um, because it, 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 it's not coming from, from a politician's perspective, it's coming from medical experts. It's coming from people who are making policy decisions um, by you know, evaluating what they're seeing in the ICU, for example. So it's, it's so powerful. And, and I, I, I have to say a big shout out to all of you for that. Um, I think the, 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 you know, there, there has been some changes that we're making during this pandemic and I really hope those last, you know, even beyond the pandemic, because that will be what defines what the new normal looks like. And frankly, I don't want it to go back to how it was, because I don't think what we had before was working. And I'm sure many, many people will agree with me, um, because the, the way things were before, they were not good. We still had problems with homelessness. We still had long lineups um, and backlogs of, in our hospitals. And if we continue to go the same way that we, we were, or at least try to go back to where we were, it's not going to be, um, it, it won't be equitable. It won't provide the support that our community needs. And, uh, and I don't think that's what people want right now. Um, when I look at the faces of, of the many South Asian aunties and uncles, who I, you know, I refer to all the time, I don't think that's what they want. And I think they're looking forward to a, a better, uh, a more equitable future. So, so I know I've, I, I, I think I'm not going to talk too much and then I go into it and then there's <laughs> that I talk too much. So I'm going to end here and say thank you very much. Thanks so much for your story. And thank you to everyone for highlighting such important things through your stories and also for working on creating the change that you are. Um, so from CASA, we have one last question, um, which I'll hand it off to Warda to present to our panelists. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Uh, I really 
I really appreciate how you guys kind of insinuate that this new normal will be informed by these personal stories and experiences. They've changed us all, hopefully for the better. So my question is regarding um, challenges. So this year, we're happy to have a selection of COVID heroes of various age and fields. With the ever-changing environment of the pandemic, and as a South Asian leader, can you describe some of the challenges faced in your respective areas of work? Um, I know there was mention of legislative challenges, but anything beyond that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you all so much. So we're also just putting that question in the chat. It was a little bit of a long one. Um, so for this, Dr. Samir Sin, how would you like to start us off? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the there are so many challenges. I think that we've 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 highlighted that we we've seen, and I think that you know each of us can you know has, has been articulating something that we've been championing, and and how we've seen um, you know clear challenge that frankly you know kind of with policy, with legislation, with you know there are different tools that we have in our toolbox um, to create you know a just society, and I think sometimes people always look at these things as um, expenses, right? You know, that, oh, that's actually gonna cost money or that actually, when when actually just doing things better in a, in a more equitable way can often save money and it actually can can allow our economy to thrive and, and all citizens to thrive. Um, but sometimes it means that, you know, some people get less and uh, so that everybody can get more, if you will, in that way. So, so I, you know, I'll, the one area that I'll focus on um, is, you know, the area of long-term care. Um, and that's, you know, an area where I think there weren't a lot of people who, I think a lot of people just generally, you know, knew that it wasn't the best place to end up in. Um, and people didn't know much about it, but they just knew that it would generally wasn't great. Um, and, uh, and they were just hoping to not end up there. But I think um, one thing that this pandemic did, um, and this has been an area that I started my career working as a long-term care physician, um, is that uh, I think now everybody knows about long-term care. Um, everybody knows about the challenges, and not only the challenges of that that we face, you know, within you know the area of long-term care, but also just kind of how we generally support our aging population to stay healthy and independent longer. And so when we think about some of the things about how do we help people stay healthy and well and independent, I mean, those are the sorts of things that we can do at a young age that can help us, you know, as we get older, how we need to have more um, home and community care and other supports that don't mean that people end up in long-term care because we have inadequate public services. And ironically, um, you know, when we don't have enough home and community care, which is often cheaper to provide for, if you will, as a whole, um, it actually saves our society more when we can keep people more healthy and independent in their communities. Uh, but, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the challenges, you know, that exist in long-term care, there are many, um, and many of them are structural and they're problematic and they've been long-standing, um, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. And, and so one of the things that I became quite hopeful around was, you know, the work that I was asked to lead um, last fall, which was, you know, the prime minister, as you heard, um, and the federal government started talking about, you know, the opportunity to develop national long-term care standards. Um, and as an opportunity where this is something that's all within the provincial and territorial jurisdiction. And of course, there's this delicate dance that I think Dr. Sharma can talk about, about what can, what do we do in a federation to deal with something that's not an Ontario issue or a Newfoundland and Labrador issue, but a national issue. Um, and so one of the opportunities is to develop you know, new standards that really allow us to reflect back on what hasn't worked well, where do we need to go, um, and how do we do this in an inclusive process where everybody can participate in saying, this is what we think long-term care should look like. This is actually how we think it should be organized and how it can support people living there, their families, but also people, most importantly, who are working there too. Um, and, and I think that's a process that I've been really proud to be a part of and that I'll be chairing one of the key committees that's actually going to be doing this work. And it's been great because already by making it an open process, we've had over 250 people apply you know, uh, you know, people who I've gotten to know that I didn't know before, who, who've um, have incredible experience and and a real passion to kind of get this better. And we've had thousands of people who've already, you know, um, uh, participated in our online survey. And we haven't even kind of we haven't even gotten started yet. And that's the exciting part. We're hoping to announce everything in June, 
as we get everything rolling. Um, and this is going to be a, an, a, a, you know, almost a two year process. But what we're hoping is what we come out as a standard that Canadians have participated in creating, something that reflects our diversity and our needs for what we want long term care to look like. Um, and, and the neat thing about standards is standards can become the basis of legislation. They can come the basis of accreditation. They can come the basis of regulation, enforcement, inspections, and that. But I think the most important thing is, first of all, agreeing upon what we think as Canadians matter when it comes to, you know, our future care, whether that's our care and long-term care, the care of loved ones, and how we can all be a part of. So that's been one of the nice things, if you will, to come out of the pandemic is an opportunity to do better. Um, and an opportunity to be engaged. And so um, that's something that I look forward to as a, a real challenge that I think needs to be taken seriously, that needs to be done thoughtfully. Um, and I'm really glad to see that so many people have come forward saying we want to participate and we want to help. So we get this right once and for all. So uh, I, I'm not, you know, going to stand here and say we're going to fix it in a year. I mean, these have been issues that have been longstanding for decades upon decades. But if this is something that we can do in a thoughtful way to move things forward, um, that's great. Um, and and I, I really want to dedicate a lot of time over the next year to getting that right um, and and doing doing justice to something that we've seen such tragedy for um, for Canadians in general, but also that have made us an international outlier in terms of having the worst performance um, uh, of the G20 countries in terms of our performance in this area. So we have a lot of work to do, but I think this is a challenge that be can, can become an opportunity, at least to recognize the thousands of people who sadly lost their lives in these settings because we didn't do better before. So, so that's one challenge I look at and, uh, and that I'm hoping to, uh, to make a difference around. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Dr. Supriya Sharma, would you like to go next and describe some challenges you found in your respective area of work? Sure, I will not get into federal provincial territorial dynamics. That's an entirely, that could, that could take up uh, about two, three hours of discussion um, in and of itself. Um, I think one of the challenges that really came to the fore um, is that, you know, we have the pandemic, but we have also got an infodemic. So whether it was on, um, you know, kind of one, one side, it was the conspiracy theories, the misinformation, disinformation, sort of act like that active people trying to sow seeds of whether it was doubt or misinformation, um, or whether it was like actually people that are very well-meaning. I mean, I think there is nothing on the planet faster than a message in a WhatsApp group. Um, and if it's in an anti South Asian anti WhatsApp group, it's double the speed. Um, so any message that I got that started with uh, Menisuna, I was like, oh, oh, okay, you know, we'll have to see. So which is I heard, um, and then it would go from there. So, um, you know, I think we would we were really trying to make sure that doing two things: one, that we put we were really honest and open and transparent about what we knew, what we didn't know, and how we were going to get to a place where we could find out what we we didn't know. Um, you know, we were trying to get out as much as possible, whether it's it's press conferences or media and actually answer questions like we're not you know it's not media lines it's not bridging back to your messaging is answering those questions but the most important part of it is that you need to meet people where they are right so whatever levels of government that you're at you have a certain voice but it's peer-to-peer -peer, it's local and all information um, especially in in a lot of communities is really based on those personal relationships and those 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 um, relationships of trust. I got so many messages through the pandemic, whereas people I hadn't heard from a long time kind of sent me a little message and did the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, tell me what's really happening, like, you know, pull back the curtain, tell me the things that you can't say. And I would say, you know, I'm, there isn't anything that I'm not saying. Everything, you know, we, we are, there's nothing we're hiding. We're putting out all of the information. There would be nothing that I would tell you as somebody that knows me personally that I wouldn't be telling people, um, you know, through all of the other avenues. So I think that's really important. We really want to make sure that people have information to, to empower themselves to make the decisions, you know, for themselves, for their families and for their loved ones, but also did a lot of work funding local organizations on the ground. 
um, to be able to provide that information. You know, I just, some of the, obviously the South Asian COVID-19 um, task force and groups like Upna Health, the work that Sumit, Sukmeet was doing, of course, the work for, of CASA, you know, those are just some of the organizations. Um, but I just think that, you know, nobody has a monopoly on information. Um, there's also a lot of places where there's a lot of echo chambers. So you're just, you're hearing the same things um, in your communities. You're not necessarily, you know, hearing some of the, the external, the diversity of opinions as well. Um, and then it's just the fire hose. It's just this sheer volume of information that's, that's um, coming at people. And there really are different ways of approaching it. There's some people that just say, I want to know everything. Give me all the stats. I'm going to chew through it and I'm going to make my decisions. And then there are other people that said, it's just too much at this point in time. Please just call me in a couple of weeks and tell me what it is that I'm supposed to do. Both valid, both very you know honest and 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 um, authentic ways of, of reacting to information. I think our job is to really to put out accurate, credible, trustworthy information in a buffet, and then people can pick and choose from it what what um, really serves them. So I think that's the that's and I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge. It's not just obviously in health; it's on the political front. It's on it's on everywhere. We're really really battling. Um, how to how to provide the right information at the right time for you know for when people need it. For sure. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, Dr. Nahid Dosani, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. I mean, when I think about this question, um, some of the challenges um, that you know health um, activism and health justice activists faced. Um, is that we were gaslighted so much during this pandemic. In fact, I've never used that word so often um, in my communication. I just, for those who don't know what gaslighting is, it's a form of psychological abuse where a person or group makes someone question their sanity, perception of reality or memories. And it makes people feel confused, anxious and unable to trust themselves. And as a clinician and someone who's worked in health activism for years, I saw um, you know, time and time again that our governments and particularly here in Ontario continued to gaslight us on every and any topic that made any sense to help people around systemic racism, around vaccine equity, around labor, around housing, public health restrictions, planning for critical care capacity. We functioned in a, in a, during this pandemic at many times, it felt like facts didn't matter. It felt like science didn't matter. It really felt like the evidence didn't matter. We've talked about paid sick leave already, but you know, around long-term care, as one of the co-founders of Doctors for Justice and Long-Term Care, I joined over a thousand um, doctors, researchers, academics who said, we will no longer stand for this humanitarian crisis. There was a time during COVID-19 where one person was dying every hour in our long-term care facilities. And we saw um, these lessons happen in the first wave and very little was done in the second wave. Um, uh, we had workers who were PSWs, who were earning so little money that they're living in homeless shelters, working in multiple homes because the work is so precarious, who then got COVID-19 in those homes and then brought it back to the homeless shelter. This is this is healthcare. This is how we treat our staff. This is how we treat our workers. Um, you know, we saw that in for-profit homes, there was a significant proportion of deaths that happened. And what we saw in terms of a government response was actually just to protect for-profit companies. The Long-Term Care Commission came back and it's, it's an incredible read. I cried reading it, it was surreal to see the reality. And what it basically summarized was that we were not prepared. Our long-term care facilities were not prepared. We're now getting more reports coming out saying people died of dehydration and neglect, not even COVID. People were dying because if they would have lived, if they just had water. This is Ontario, this is Canada in our long-term care facilities. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, um, you know, April 16th, I will never forget, we expected a, an announcement from our government that would have helped people like paid sick leave, like paid time off for vaccination, moving vaccines to hotspots. And what they announced, was carting and policing and 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 stopping people in the street and shutting down outdoor spaces and um there was no evidence for that. Like it was just ideological uh, 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 tactics and, and policies. Um, you know, we knew very early on people experiencing homelessness were getting sick and dying of COVID. And we had the evidence, I've shared the stats already around how this population was impacted. And yet we had to fight tooth and nail to get this population to be uh, um, accepted as a priority population for vaccination. We ended up getting that through. I don't know how, but it happened. They were accepted for phase two vaccination. And so one of the biggest challenges of this pandemic was that we were gaslighted on every level, on every issue that really pushed forth, pushed forward health equity. And it's exhausting. 
personally, it was exhausting. It's exhausting for my colleagues, the organizations I work with. Um, and it was almost at this point where every day you'd wake up and be like, there's about 15 things I could like write about, speak about, tweet about, you know, post about, and which one it matters more. And it, they all mattered equally. It was just so confusing and so complex. And so it's a reminder that the power, you know, it, it's these events and conversations like this, the way we're all rallying together is a reminder that the power is not in, 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 in people in power in government. The power is in the people. They're in you, they're in the organizations you represent and the people you fight tooth and nail for to, 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 to derive health equity by design in your communities. And I think that's what health justice is really about. I think we have to talk about how exhausting this was. We have to talk about the feelings. We felt the rage that we felt. Um, my new answer is like, how are you doing? I'm pandemic fine. You know, like I'm okay, but I'm pandemic fine. That's my new kind of baseline. Um, and um, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. It was a significant challenge. And uh, I hope I, I say the word gaslighting less uh, as this pandemic, we move into the next few phases. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, Dolly Begum, would you like to share? Sure. Um, there is, it, it's actually, um, as, as Nefidi was talking about gaslighting, I, like, I'm afraid to go on Twitter these days because there's always at least one message or, or something. Um, just yesterday, I, I, I think I had a tough time sleeping um, just, just because of some of the messages I've, I've gotten uh, the last two days. And, and, um, and that moment where, where you just cannot have a civilized conversation with some, some folks. Um, and it just, it's just tough because um, there's, there's some, some things you just cannot, there's, like if it's black and white, it is black and white and you just, it, it's, yeah. So, so thank you Nahid for that. I think that was, yeah, I, um, there, there is a few things I, I would say. And, um, but I'm gonna start off with one, one single thing. And, and I hope that everyone here, and honestly, I, I hope from this pandemic will take away, is that expect more from your public representatives. Raise the bar, let's, let's raise the bar. Let's expect more hold them accountable. Honestly, it's if because if we don't, if you don't, then then no one else will. And and it's your family, your community that will suffer. And so we should definitely expect more. Expect more of me. Expect more of every single person that represents in whatever level it is. Um, and 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 that, that's their job, right? And and we have to make sure that if we ever face a pandemic like this, and, and God forbid, you know, we might have a fourth wave and I know the doctors are here. So I, I look at all of you um, for, for that. But I, I, I mean, I, I don't think my community can take one more, you know, like it's just, it's been so hard for people. It's been so, so tough. Um, and, and there are real changes we could make that would have actually prevented us, that would have prevented so many deaths. We talked about long-term care, um, you know, on, on, on New Year's Day, actually. Uh, we had uh, we organized an event, and I think on January second or third we held a town hall, a virtual town hall that ended up um, being viewed and shared like thousands of times, and and it was incredible. Uh, but it it shouldn't have been like it shouldn't have been necessary, you know. Um, why one New Year's Day was I talking to people crying on the phone about how he's trying to write a message? in Cantonese so that she could put it up in her room just so she could get a glass of water. Like that, that is like, my parents came to Canada so they could have better healthcare and to education. Those are the two things my parents tell me every single time, healthcare and education, that's why they came here. And I think a lot of us relate to that. I think every South Asian has one of those stories why your parents or grandparents came here. Um, I have never imagined that I would be talking to someone who's trying to tell me how they have written a message for their grandma so she could get a glass of water, a warm glass of water. Um, and, and then just in that event, we were hearing so many heartbreaking stories. Um, and the sad part was within those two days, his grandmother died. Um, so when he joined the event and he just shared that information with us, um, I, I just on live television, we are you know, on our Zoom call that's been streamed on television and I'm getting messages from my staff and they're saying, just hold on, it's, it's okay. Um, because we all have our tears coming down and and we just don't know how to control our emotions and then figure out how do you have this conversation that is so critical to make sure that the world gets to know what's happening in these homes. 
Uh, so so it, it's, uh, I think there's been a lot of challenges when we talk about uh, policymakers and policy, um, effective policies and, and how we hold our representatives um, accountable. It's, um, and, and, you know, there's, it's also I, one of the things I learned, I think, over the past uh, year and a half is that there's a lot of political ping pong that gets played. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very common thing now, now I get to see. Um, and it's, it's interesting because just today I was uh, in the legislature and we talked about the fact that there, um, there are foreign uh, trained physicians who are here and there is about 3,500 of them who have gone through their qualification and they're asking, begging to help. Um, and yet we have our government calling on um, the Philippines, <laughs> calling on other provinces to send doctors and, and nurses here. Um, and meanwhile, our doctors and nurses are exhausted. Um, they're having uh, an extremely painful, difficult time um, in, in, in our healthcare system. So it's, it's uh, and, then, and then obviously well, what I get from, in terms of responses is, is you know, whose responsibility it is, or you know, what would the OMA say, or what would the hospital association say, or, or you know, what uh, um, our, uh, each level of government can do. So, so at the end of the day, it's, you know, hold your, account, your politicians accountable, but do it from an equity lens. And I think that's a challenge that we continue to face. We see change happen, but sometimes those change don't have an equity lens. And that I think has been the, has been unveiled um, a lot. And um, I, I know a few of the other panelists talked about vaccine hesitancy versus vaccine equity. Um, so true for Scarborough, uh, for many other regions of this province. Um, I remember, you know, three, four months ago in the legislature, I kept hearing uh, some of the people, uh, the numbers are low, it's because people are hesitant. I was like, no, let's, let's hold on because I can get you a few thousand people lined up right now. <laughs> Their people are not hesitant. Why don't we talk about hesitancy after we have vaccinated the people who are ready to get vaccinated? Um, and I'm not saying there isn't, there aren't people who are hesitant and there are some real conversations that needs to be had for that as well. But it's important that we recognize and we do not blame the racialized communities, um, you know, brown, black communities for hesitancy. And, and those are very important conversation and that needs to be looked at through that equity lens. Um, any sort of strategies, when we, talk, when we talk about paid sick days, when we talk about the CERB program, when we talk about any of these things that has taken place, um, it, it's, it's truly, truly important for us to do it by understanding what's happening uh, within those marginalized communities, within the racialized communities. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things we could talk about and I think we've got a fantastic panel here. Um, it's actually that, uh, that we'll be able to carry on this conversation for hours and hours. So, so that's all I'll say for now. Agreed, thank you so much. And thanks also for sharing that story about um, what happened during New Year's that was very um, eye-opening. Um, I'd like to ask now, Sikmeet, would you like to share? Sure. I wrote down a few of the challenges, but they kept getting knocked off every time someone spoke. So I will try to be quick. Uh, the number one challenge that I faced in the beginning when I started this initiative was the fact that we're all youth. Um, a lot of the times, uh, adults always say, you know, youth are the future, youth are the new generation, youth are going to be leading, but like, give us the platform, give us a space to be able to do that. And I had to advocate for myself, for my team so many times, we were always undermined. In the beginning, I remember we were told this Gurdwara initiative is not going to work. Uh, no one's going to really listen to your messaging. It's not going to be effective. And I'm the type of person, I'm like, if you tell me no, I will prove you wrong. And I will uh, try to make sure that it does work because I created the whole plan, everything. There was really, I tried to ask businesses if there was any funding available that you can give us so that we can make sure our volunteers are safe. No one gave it to us. I spent my own money to help make it happen. The Clinton Foundation got on board with our project. They helped fund our initiative we made it happen. And so I think at the end of the day, youth are really powerhouses that need to be utilized more. I was just last week on a panel with the Premier of British Columbia. The other day I received a message from Dr. Teresa Tam acknowledging the work that our youth are doing. We were highlighted by the Commonwealth as one of 10 uh, youth uh, COVID-19 heroes from around the world. Now CASA's honoring us with this. I think 
it just shows that youth can literally, if we put our mind to it, we can do whatever we want. And I think that's what I really want the message out there, especially during this time. I think we often neglect how youth are feeling during this pandemic. And, and this whole initiative has been all youth led. We have over 150 youth. We started in Surrey, it's now expanded across Canada and even people in the United States are reaching out all the way to Kenya of how can we get involved with this project. And again, I just wanna tell all the youth out there, um, your opportunities are endless. You can do whatever you want to do. Um, never give up during this process. I know so many people who said no to me, but like, you know, like I, I did, you can do the same. <laughs> And I think this pandemic really highlighted as well. Uh, when the pandemic hit, youth were not having the opportunities to volunteer anymore. For instance, grade 11 students, grade 12 students that needed to do their volunteer hours, for instance, to fin fulfill a part of their curriculum, they weren't able to do any of that. And so for me, uh, from a community like Surrey, which often in the media is labeled as a community with a lot of gang violence, with a lot of shootings, um, I wanted to take that narrative away and change the narrative. And that's why when the media interviewed me, I always mentioned the fact that we are South Asian youth that are leading this movement um, in the Gurdwara. And now we wanna to expand to Mandirs, we wanna expand to mosques, we wanna expand to different areas. Because like Dr. Sharma mentioned, I actually wrote that in my, in my little comment and you mentioned it already, it's to meet people where they're at. If we meet people where they're at, I think we can solve a lot of the problems that are at hand. And we can really help reduce a, a lot of the inequities that we're facing. And I think that's a message that I would like to leave it here at. Awesome, man. First of all, congratulations on such amazing initiatives and reaching such great achievements over the year. Um, I'd, now I wanna see if Firuz, would you like to unmute and share? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's so incredible hearing about um, what you were talking about, Sydney. That's it's as a fellow youth, that's really inspiring as well. Um, and I guess talking about public washings, there's one of the biggest challenges that I've been having um, is trying to overcome the stigma and the negative stereotypes that have been associated with public washings. As soon as we even mention the word, people immediately associated with illicit behavior. NIMBYism, not, not in my backyard, and they're stigmatized so much, but they are an essential part of our um, communities, and they're important for building healthy, inclusive, and most importantly, um, sustainable communities, and the pandemic has really shed light on the fact that we should, we can't be taking reactive measures anymore. We need to take proactive measures where we can um, really address the problem before it becomes a problem because real people's lives are at risk. People like you and me, we're being impacted every day um, and we need to be moving away from these stereotypes. And that's been a challenge that I've been trying to address through the social media campaign that Hamlet Washrooms has been doing. Um, so there's a lot of that listening and learning that we can do at the community level to really understand the needs of the individuals in our communities, the smallest changes can be so empowering, but it's about how can we go about that um, in an equitable way as well. Um, and I think as a social media campaign, um, also as a, as a youth run social media campaign, it was similar to what Sukmeet was saying. Um, I was always wondering, is my voice going to be heard? Will people be receptive to what I'm trying to say? Um, will they want to talk to me about this issue? Um, I guess at a personal level, as a youth advocate who's just coming into this space as well, um, I I felt imposter syndrome at times, feeling inadequate or questioning if do I belong here um, or am I worthy enough to be here? So, but it's really just throughout the whole process of this, it's coming to um, terms with the fact that um, I've, I can be surrounded by all of these amazing individuals who are inspiring me every single day, but also celebrating my own successes or my own growth. And it's um, embracing that. And it's about finding a community that you can lean on for support and find mentorship with, um, and just really empowering yourself through reflection or through those discussions 
giving your space, uh, giving yourself space to learn and to grow and, um, and just accepting that. So yeah, those are some of the challenges that I've faced, but uh, some things that I've been trying to do as well. Thanks, Fires. Um, so that was our last um, question for the panel discussion. I just wanna take the time to mention that it has been a year of change, growth, for, and learning for all of us. So to really hear all of your different perspectives and your experiences in your respective fields has been really eye-opening for I think everyone. So thank you to all our panelists, to all our COVID-19 heroes and the attendees um, for being here. And thank you to the panelists for sharing your thoughts and teaching us about what you've learned over the past year. So we do have a couple of questions from the audience that Samia will read out. Um, so I'll just pass it off to Samia to do that. Great, thanks Sakshi. So there's um, several questions and I know we are a little bit tight for time. So I had to do the difficult task of choosing two um, and to see if you know anyone from the panel can, uh, can answer, is willing to answer. The first one, um, this one is actually directed to Dr. Sinha. Um, and it was about a tweet that you had sent, um, I believe a couple of months ago where you had come back home after a long shift. I think it was 17 to 18 hours of working. Um, so the question is, what motivates you to keep going, um, to keep going back into the field um, where you know that people are suffering, um, you're exposed, um, but you still are there every single day? What motivates you? You know, I think it's, I think it's that, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I think, you know, I think I and many of my colleagues went into healthcare is because, you know, we fundamentally want to help people. Um, and that if you have the strength to carry on and to do something, you know, the, um, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to serve others. Um, and at a time like this, um, again, you know, you know, I think some of us have shared some of the challenges that we've had, you know, and when, um, when Dolly was sharing, you know, that, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the, the unnecessity of hate that one will receive, you know, from, from, you know, on Twitter and, and, and when, you know, and sadly, you know, colleagues pull you down or others try and lift you up. I think the key is, you know, that, that we are all very lucky that, you know, when we are able to help others as in a small way or a large way, um, that it's important that we do. Um, and that frankly, if you don't step up and if you can't step up in some little way um, or some big way, whatever way you can, um, you don't move, the, you don't move the things forward. So um, it what one thing that's been absolutely inspiring is to see how much my colleagues have come together, you know, at the hospitals I work at and how, you know, despite being exhausted, tired, um, and sometimes it's hard to get up in the morning, you realize that we're all here trying to support each other to move things forward and, and to get through this together. And I think that's kind of what inspires me to stay kind of fighting for this, because I believe that through our efforts, you know, that, um, that we are making positive change. And the more positive change is out there, the more chance we have to really actually change things for the better. So I think that's kind of what's inspired me to keep going, even though it's been an incredibly long year and I know we're all really, really tired. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinha. And uh, again, really appreciate everything, all the sacrifices that you're making. Um, the second question, maybe I'll direct that to Dr. Uh, Supriya Sharma. Um, so this question is about um, stigma. So there, uh, a lot of people have indicated that they're seeing uh, within the communities if someone, someone tests positive. Um, there's a lot of stigma attached to that. Um, the example that was given is one neighbor um, was tested positive and months later, people still don't want to meet with that neighbor um, and don't want to accept food from that neighbor. So what advice would you give to the community when we're seeing this kind of um, stigma being attached to being tested positive? Yeah, I mean, I think the stigma is based on misinformation. It's the same sort of things that the idea is that, um, you know, that person, you know, and I've heard everything. So whether it's that person can still be infectious or that there's something else that that person then will carry that they'll shed, they potentially, you know, will, will as we said, infect someone else. I mean, I think the biggest part of it is to the best, the best counter to stigma is normalization of things. And so, you know, it is that, 
if you think about what happened in Nova Scotia when they had a, a slight uptick in their cases where they hadn't seen it before and it was just everybody came out and got tested, right? So it's not it's not that certain groups are being targeted, it's not um, that they're being sing signaled out, um, but it's that everybody is, is, is sort of subject to the same sort of standards. I think the other part of the stigma though is that there are consequences um, for people who test positive that then you know, whether it's um, they don't want to get tested because if they get pos tested positive, then they won't be able to go to work. And then we have all of those issues around uh, paid sick leave and and others. Um, there's, you know, whether or not they feel that there is you no know, treatment. And so there's some sometimes there's this feeling of like, if I don't know, then it, it'll just it'll be OK. And then you know, there's a lot of information about, well, it's not if you're otherwise healthy, it's not going to be that bad. And. So I think it's really, it's like anything else in that um, it comes down to individuals, right? And where where does that come from? Where do those, where does that information come from? Where are they basing those sort of decisions? But again, kind of normalizing it as much as possible, putting out accurate information. Um, I think one of the things that the structural sort of things that we can do, one of the things that, you know, we've done is, is um, authorizing, finally authorizing home tests Kit. So, you know, you're not actually not putting yourself in a position where you're doing that either publicly or potentially putting yourself at risk on the way to get tested. So, you know, I think we have to, like anything else in COVID, you have to sort of attack it from multi-directional sort of approach and then kind of get to the, the, the heart of it. Great, thank you so much. So that is uh, the end of our time together. I want to respect everyone's time um, today. And I know a lot of people here are uh, celebrating Eid in our audience. So I want to let everyone go on time. Thank you uh, immensely to our panelists today. And again, if anyone um, has been impacted by some of the, um, the hate that we received today, please do connect with CASA and to see how we can rectify some of those things. Um, on a separate note, CASA has been doing a lot of work on anti-hate, whether it's on social media, whether it's um, hate crime reporting. Um, so we we would love to, to support you in whatever way, way we can. Um, I wanted to, before we close, thank um, the East Mississauga Community Health Center for supporting this event. Um, really appreciate the support we received from them. And once again, thank you everybody. Congratulations to our COVID heroes and really hope this is the final year of this pandemic. And in 2022, uh, we can look beyond it. Uh, we can have a better future for all of us. Um, we can actually build back better with, um, like Dolly Begum said, with uh, equity in our minds um, and in our programs and in our services and in our policies. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Take care. <laughs>